And there are times where we highlight certain things. Yeah. Well, this morning, this word is for all of us, but I felt God highlight three particular individuals and that this word specifically is for them and what God is doing with them. And it's Ezekiel. Ezekiel, you want to stand? Um, Dominique? Where's Dominique? You want to stand up? Stand up. Stay standing. And then uh, Giovanni. It's amazing to me how, you know, there's 7 billion people on the planet. God's getting a lot of information, right? He's busy, busy guy. But for him to stop and to highlight these three, it's just aw and just awesome to me that in, in all that God's got going on, he stops. And it reminds me of the scripture in um, the Bible in the New Testament where, Jer- where Jesus is going into Jericho and he hears Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus, speak his name. And, and all of the commotion, every time Jesus went into a town, everybody was all over him. So he, he could hearly, hardly hear or do anything. But he heard Bartimaeus above all the crowd. And he stopped. And he asked, he said, have him come here. And I felt like God was saying, specifically regarding these three, that he's stopping and he's highlighting who these three young men are. And the word that's for them this morning. Ezekiel, it, it means, that name means the strength of God. Dominic means of God. And Giovanni means God is gracious. Isn't that amazing? God is gracious of God and strength of God. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. You guys can be seated. This this message that I'm, I'm giving is for you three. We all can glean from it. We all should glean from it. But it is God speaking specifically to the three of you about who he's calling you to be. And when God spoke to me to, to get my attention, it, let, me, let, me, let me say this first. Part of, the reason, part of the reason that I read the Bible is, is so that when he speaks, I know, I can recognize what he's saying to me. So however long, strong, or short, or silent, I can recognize this is God. God's, God's got something to say about this or this thing, this person, this situation. So part of, part of the reason that I read the Bible, and we should read the Bible, is that when he speaks, then we recognize. In, in other words, he has a canvas to paint on, right? So, so in my time with the Lord, I heard the Lord say, the three. That's all he said. He said, the three. And then he spoke their names. And immediately when he said, the three, I knew exactly what he was talking about. Not the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. He wasn't talking about that three. And I'm going to share with you the three that he's talking about. But immediately, I knew what he was talking about. And so, today's message is the heart of the three. This is 2 Samuel 23. We can start in uh, verse 8. And the caption of this passage is David's mighty warriors. It says, these are the names of David's mighty warriors. Joshua, Basabeth, the Tachmanite, was chief of the three. He raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter. 
Next to him was Eleazar, son of Dodai, the Aoite. As one of the three mighty warriors, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines, gathered it past the men for battle. Then the Israelites retreated, but Eleazar stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eleazar, but only to strip the dead. Next to him was Shammah, son of A.G., the Hararite. When the Philistines banded together at a place where there was a field full of lentils, Israel's troops fled from them. But Shammah took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down, and the Lord brought about a great victory. During harvest time, three of the 30 chief warriors came down to David at the cave of Adullam while a band of Philistines was encamped at the Valley of Rephraim. At that time, David was in the stronghold and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water and said, oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from that well near the gate of Bethlehem. So the three mighty warriors broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord. Far be it from me, Lord, to do this, he said. It is not the blood, is it not the blood of the, of the men who went at the risk of their lives and, and David would not drink it. Such were the exploits of the three mighty warriors. You know, prophecy is, um, it's about our future. And what happens, you know, sometimes, sometimes I think we think that God is evolving linearly with time the way we are evolving linearly with time. God is outside of time. God's, he's, he's in our past, he's in our present, and he's in our future all at the same time. So what prophecy is, it's, it's God who's in our future. He takes a snapshot, a, a selfie of, of us. He, 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 he takes a picture of us in our future and he brings it back to our present and he reveals it to us so that we can agree with what he said, with what he showed us. It's not magic. It's us coming into agreement with what God has shown us about our future. So parents, it's really important for you, as it is for the three, to take what I'm saying today, sort of just like Mary, when um, Gabriel came to her and said, this is what's going to happen to you. The Holy Spirit is going to come up on you, and you're going to have a child. She didn't understand it all. She was, she was a bit perplexed by what Gabriel was saying to her. But her words were, be it unto me according to your word. And that's the agreement. And what God is looking for is he's always looking for agreement with what he's doing with us. And so the prophetic word is us coming into agreement with what he snaps, with, with the picture he, he takes of us and brings it back to our present so that we can align our hearts with it. This then enables us and the word of God to come into alignment and for the word of God to come true. It's not magic, but it is our agreement with the word of God. So just like David was king, and he has these mighty warriors. Jesus is king. And we are his mighty warriors. 
But even among the many, if you continue to read this chapter, there were actually more than three mighty warriors. There were quite a, quite a number. At the end of this chapter, it says 37, but if you read further, it's even more than that. But he highlights these three. He highlights these three. And what I felt like the Lord wanted to share with me for you are four attributes that he is working. Sort of like you knead the, 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 the yeast into the dough. You need, you're kneading the bread. He's working in us. And he's working in the three of them. And this first attribute is courage. This guy, one of the mighty warriors, kills 800 warriors by himself. You know, I'm always, I'm always amazed, and I think it's kind of funny, when, like, let's take John Wick. Or you can, you can, you can think about maybe uh, Captain America or somebody. They'll be fighting and they'll be beating up one guy, and then you'll have four guys waiting after he beats up this guy. Then the other guy will come, and then he'll beat up that guy. Then you have four guys wait, and then I'm like, yeah, but they, they're not all really getting him at the same time. <laughs> they want you to think that, but that, that's not really happening. Well, let me tell you, that's what's happening with this guy. He, he kills 800 of them. And they're not just waiting in line. Okay, it's my turn to die. He's just a bad dude. He, he's a bad dude. And it requires courage. Courage. Now, when we think of courage, we think of the outward, the strength, the fierceness, right? But here is what I heard the Lord speak to me regarding courage. And that he's working in the three of you. Inner strength. Inner strength. It's not the kind of courage that you would see in terms of beating up 800 people. It's a confidence of knowing who you are and whose you are. This is the kind of confidence Jesus had. Remember, Jesus gets baptized. We're going to have a baptism this evening. Jesus gets baptized, and when he comes up out of the water, they hear God speak. And, and what he says is, this is my son, whom I love. In him I am well pleased. And here is what God is saying about the three of you. I am well pleased. And knowing that God approves of you is the beginning of inner security. Because when you have inner security, what anybody says, what anybody does, falls off. Falls off. Because you're secure. Believe it or not, that's one thing that we are missing in our world is people with inner security. I was watching the news, which I don't often, but I was watching the news one day last week, and the Surgeon General said that social media could be hazardous to your health. Isn't that amazing? I thought, and then I paused, and then I said, the, for children, for children, but, but for adults too, I believe, because their minds can absorb all the negativity. Their minds can't filter all the negativity. And so what happens, more and more and more young people are being influenced in a negative way by social media. And they don't have the mindset 
to be able to allow that to filter. And that's why so many have committed suicide. But for the three of you, God has said, you will have inner security because you will know that your strength is in me. Your strength is in me. Courage. We all need it. We all need it. We all have to be safe and secure with him. You know, um, a lot of things don't work out the way we'd like. We don't, we don't get what we always want. Things don't happen in our time frame, on our timeline. This is why we need trust. We don't need trust if everything worked out the way we want it to. We don't have to trust God if everything worked out the way we thought it should. But because things don't work out the way we'd like for them to, on our timeline or otherwise, we have to trust. And it is this inner security that allows us to trust God despite all of the stuff that's going on in our world and against us. We can be secure in knowing I trust God. I trust him. I trust his faithfulness. I trust who he is. And I trust what he has said about me and to me. This is the courage that I'm talking about. The second attribute, let's look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, says Eleazar, but Eleazar stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. Well, in scripture, what's the sword? The Bible. Here, his hand, you can think of it like this, his hand and the word of God became one. And here's what I, I felt like the Lord was saying to us, but specifically to the three, that I am imparting my word to you so that you and my word become one. That there's no separation between you and my word. The Bible talks about in the New Testament living epistles known and read by all men. And what God is saying is that we should embody the word. The word shouldn't be apart from us. The word should be us. When, when people look at our lives, they should be able to read the word. Our lives should reflect what the Bible says. And I think too often, our lives don't. So what we have to do is we have to give them the word. Well, here's what the word says. When, in fact, our lives should be the word of God. And what the Lord is saying about the three is that I am working in you a desire to know my word and to come into agreement with my word and to be one with my word. Several, maybe a month or so ago, I was having a conversation with Leah, who's Ezekiel's grandmother, and she was telling me, you know, he just reads his Bible on his own. Nobody even asks him or tells him to. He just reads it. And I thought, ah, wonderful, wonderful. This is what he's working 
in the three of you. A desire to know his word so that you can come into agreement with it and that you would embody it. You know, part of the, the issue with the world is because we, the body of Christ, wants to throw scriptures at people in the world. And they don't like it. They don't like it. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus just was an example of the word. And when they saw his life, they actually saw light. And they could recognize his life and the light of his life. And they could see in their lives, my life doesn't line up with his life. I have some work to do. Never saying a word. It's something about light that resonates. But it happens when we actually become the, 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 the life reflection, the life source. Not, not the source in ultimate source. We know he is the source of all things. But the light emanates from us because of our understanding of who we are and whose we are and our oneness with the word of God. This is a big deal. This is a big deal. I believe God is raising us up, specifically the three, so that we can be an example of his word and not just giving somebody the word like a piece of meat. And God is calling us to live out the word of God. Live it out. Be an example of it. Yeah. Yep. Before we can live it out, we actually have to get it in us. We, we have to get it in us. David says, I hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And he's wanting to do that. He's wanting to hide his word in your hearts. Become one with his word. Verse 11, it says, next to him was Shammah, son of Aji, the Herorite. And the Philistines banded together at a place where there was a field full of lentils. Israel troops fled from them. But Shammah took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down. And the Lord brought about a great victory. So this third attribute is uncompromising. Uncompromising. When, when all of the Israelite troops were fleeing because of the threat that was coming against them, Shammah stood his ground and defended the place where he was standing. He didn't compromise and get pushed back. He defended his stance. He defended his position. No matter what. See, we live in a world that if you say something or you do something and somebody likes it, then you get canceled. And, and God is raising up a people, the three, who will defend their position and defend his position. 
I'm not talking about being belligerent, cussing people out. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about standing firm for what we believe is the will of God and the word of God. Pushing back on anyone that wants to remove us from what God says is ours. It's a big deal in this, in this season of the world. You, you, you can't really say certain things. You can't really do certain things. You can't really voice your, your, your vantage point because you would be considered non-compliant, intolerant, you know, all the, all the phraseology that people ask when you don't go along with what the world goes along with. Listen, you, you can talk about Buddha, you can talk about all kind of religions, but once you, you mention Jesus, now all hell breaks loose. You can say, you know, I get up every morning and I pray to Buddha. And people will be like, <sighs> but if I say I get up every morning and I pray to Jesus, oh, something's wrong with him. He got issues. And then here comes the attacks. And we have to be uncompromising. And he's working in you. The three. He's working in us an uncompromising nature. Jesus was uncompromising. You know, the more uncompromising you are, the more compassionate you can be. You don't see a lot of people think, well, if, if I'm uncompromising, I have to be mean and evil and negative. But the more uncompromising I am, the more free I can be compassionate because we're secure in who we are and whose we are. So that's why Jesus could be so compassionate with all kinds of people. Because he recognized this, this isn't going to affect me. I am going to affect it. So we can have compassion for people because of the, the uncompromising nature that God is working into us. The fourth attribute when David longed for a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't command and say to the three, go get me a drink of water. He just longed for a drink. And it is that longing, it is that desire to have something that they understood. Our king desires something. And this fourth attribute that God is working in us and in the three is the desire to do the will of God. The desire, not, not just, oh, I got to do the will of God. No, no, no. The desire. So, so when God has a longing and intent, he can find that intent being fulfilled through our lives. Through your lives. You know, uh, in Genesis, the second chapter, God is creating the Garden of Eden. And the Bible says, that um, he wanted to send rain on the garden, but he didn't. he didn't. He didn't allow rain to come down. And the Bible says this, 
He says, because there was no man to tend it. That, and that's fascinating to me. God had a desire to do something. He ceased in doing it because there was no man to attend to what he wanted to do. Isn't that amazing? Like, you're God. You can create a drainage system. You don't need a man. But, but here is God wanting to partner. So what happens? He doesn't send rain, and then he goes and makes a man. Now the man has purpose. What's part of the purpose? Tend the garden. God then sends the rain. And so I feel like what God is saying to me, to us, to the three, is that you will know the intent and the desire of his heart that will be fulfilled through your life. That his desires won't go unmet. His desires won't go unmet. They will be revealed to you and you will, you will be able to respond in the same way the three responded when David said, oh, if I had a drink from that well near the gate of Bethlehem. And when God makes that statement, you will respond. And here's the interesting thing. The gate, the water, the well, was behind the enemy lines. So they have to break through the enemy lines without being seen, getting caught, fill up jugs of water, get back through the enemy lines, and bring it to David. Isn't that amazing? I just think that's amazing that this was the heart of the three. The heart of the three. To do the desire to do the will of God. In Acts it says, um, I've chosen a man David after my own heart who will do all of my bidding. He'll do, he'll do whatever I want him to do. And I believe that God is raising up us, specifically the three, to do his bidding. For his desires. That, that, that what God wants to see happen in this world, through you, might manifest. The three. The Bible says, Jesus makes a statement. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. And so it is in the context of knowing him, coming into relationship with him, loving him, that this desire to do his will might manifest. It's, 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 it's not a, 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 a rigid kind of thing. It's a, it's a heart of, 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 of relationship that out of the heart of relationship we attend to the desires of God. Amazing. It's just amazing. And, um, you know, there, there, are, there, are, there are many who believe that this next move of God, this major move of God, is going to be profoundly connected to young people. And I think the the, the 
part of what we saw at Asbury College and, and those young people. But you know, here's the interesting thing. David was somewhere, the Bible doesn't say specifically how old David was when he was anointed to go and kill Goliath. But he was somewhere, the, the, the Bible, the, the range theologians believe, somewhere between 14 and 17. Before he goes out and kills Goliath. Between 14 and 17. It's not that old. And so God doesn't have any grandchildren. He, he wants to have relationship with everybody. Doesn't matter their age. I mean, remember, remember when, when Mary goes to see Elizabeth. Elizabeth was also pregnant with John the Baptist. Remember that in Luke? She goes to see Elizabeth. And when Mary tells Elizabeth that she's pregnant, Elizabeth says, the baby in my womb leaped. John the Baptist was excited, wasn't even born yet in the womb, could recognize by the Spirit of God that Mary was pregnant with Jesus and was excited. No age limit. No age limit. And so we would do well, parents would do well to foster, develop what's being said today. Every time you hear your name called, it's a reminder of who God says you are. Um, let's have the three of you come up here. We're going to pray for the three of you. Yeah, just come. Because I want, I want, we can keep taping because I want them to see this. That way they can see it later on film. The three mighty men. How about that? <laughs> Lord, we thank you. We thank you for who you are and that you would take the time to highlight Ezekiel, Giovanni, and Dominic. We thank you that they mean everything to you that you are working in their hearts even now, God, that you have purpose and plans for their lives that's, that's, that's far beyond their understanding, their, 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 their ability, their resource, far beyond. But God, in your wisdom, your manifold wisdom, we believe and we come into agreement with the word for their lives. This, this word that, that you've spoken regarding the three of them. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for their parents and their family members who tend to them. And Father, I just pray that you would just continue to work in their hearts. They don't have to stop being kids but you can work in them all the while they're being kids. Father, strengthen them and bless them and give them wisdom beyond their age, insight and understanding. Lord, I pray that you, you, you put in their heart to obey their parents first and foremost. No back talk. God, you would be with them, that you would protect them, protect their families. I just thank you for the three, Lord. I thank you for what you're doing and will be doing in their hearts and in their minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Let's give them a hand. Yeah.
All right, gentlemen. God bless you guys. You can be seated. Yep. Let's, let's stand. Let's stand.